take your time and breathe on here. So hopefully I will do throughout this message. Um, okay, so I'm speaking this message today because um, because whilst I was at uni, there was this song, um, it's by Innovation Worship or from Innovation Church, if anybody knows who they are. And this song kept coming back to me and I was like, I really like this song. And then after as I kept listening to it, I realised even more than that. I was like, there's a word in that, like there's something important in what they're saying. And I kept listening to the song and moving on and thinking, nah, it's not for me to say, it's not for me to say. And then slowly as I came back to um, came back to Birmingham, I realised that this song really helped me and really um, encouraged me throughout my time at uni. And I was just, as I was back at home, one night I couldn't sleep, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I was like, you know what, I need to write this. So I took out my Bible and started to write it, and this is the message that I'm giving today. Um, the song and the word is called Come to the Altar. Um, and as I speak this, I'm encouraging myself as much as I'm encouraging you guys. Um, yeah, there's some things in here that I need to say to myself directly to me and need to say directly to you. Um, this is God's word um, and it's things from the Bible, so it's something to get excited about. So feel free to get excited about God's word. I'm not going to look at you if you're shouting or if you're like, yes, you know what I mean? Like, feel free to respond to it as you need to. Okay. So the altar is defined, I've got two definitions here, and it's defined as firstly, a table in a Christian church where the bread and wine are consecrated within a community and service. And then the second definition is a structure upon offerings and sacrifices are made for religious purposes. So um, as an English student, we, also, we always look at word roots and where the words come from and what their language is originally from and what's their history. Um, so I looked into the word altar, and I saw that in Hebrew, it means misbear, which means to slaughter, but it's also a place of sacrifice. And I think that definition is really important for what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask James, Nathan, and Mark out to do me a favor. In my bag, there's some sweets. Um, can you give everyone a sweet? Um, everyone's going to have a Starburst. <laughs> um, this is your Starburst. You can do with it as you wish, but you have to wait until the end of the service to eat it. But it belongs to you, it is your starburst, you can choose to do with it as you wish. I was going to put them in the back of the chair, but I didn't trust you. I think you'd see it, and you'd start eating it, and that's not the point. So, you're going to have to wait now. the definitions that I've just talked on. And the first definition of an altar is a table in the Christian church where the bread and wine are consecrated, which also means to make known um, within a communion service. So we just had communion, and this acts as our altar right here. This table acts as our altar right here. Um, so the bread and wine is seen in the Bible um, when Jesus partakes of the Last Supper. So we all know the story of the Last Supper. It's the last time he's with and his disciples, and he takes and um, partakes of the communion, and it's the first time he does it. And in this time, he explains his, his sacrifice. So in Mark chapter 14, verses 22 and 24, um, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people, poured out as a sacrifice for many. So, I know me, and I've heard that, that passage over and over, and I hear it more or less every other Sunday. So the bread represents his body, 
and the wine represents his blood. In the communion that we just had led by Elaine, we did that. We did exactly what Jesus calls us to do, to take of the bread and to take of the, um, of the wine and think of him. Um, in the same way that Jesus called the disciples to. It's something important and it's the beginning of Jesus explaining his, his sacrifice and his purpose that he was to die. That it was an important thing. So sacrifice is seen as the, in the definition um, that they're um, using the communion service, certain service, and it's something important. Sacrifice and an altar must go together. You can't have one without the other. In the same way that you can't have a sandwich without bread. You need to, they need to be together. Um, so without an app, without a, a sacrifice, there is no altar. Um, and when we have this sacrifice, um, it's, no, it's not just that table. Um, and it's not just in the Old Testament, it's not just stones. So we can go to the altar and we can receive Jesus. We can thank him, as we've just done, thank him for what he's done. Um, the altar is a place of remembrance, a remembrance of what Jesus did, his death on the cross, and give them to you. So Abraham does this in Genesis chapter 22, and he then names it at the end, and he said, the Lord will provide. When Noah built his altar in Genesis chapter 8 verse 20, he says that the Lord is a promise keeper. When Moses builds his altar in Exodus chapter 17 verses 30, he said, the Lord is my banner, he is to be lifted high. Gideon does the same, and he says that the Lord is peace. Elijah builds an altar, and he's surrounded by 450 prophets of Baal, and another load of prophets, and even against all odds, he, um, God comes through for him, and he says that the Lord is God, the Lord is the only God, he is powerful and he is mighty. So as we build these altars, we need to acknowledge who our God is, we need to know the characteristics that he has, and they need to influence our praise. So I said before, we need to come to the altar with praise and thankfulness, but by knowing our God's character, we can do that. Um, by knowing that he's done these things before, we know that he can, he's going to do them again. And even if we have an experience, we can open up our Bible and we can see that he's done that for Abraham, he's done that for Noah, he's done that for Moses, and he can do that for me. Um, and even if you don't want to look there, you can look to your neighbor and you can say, oh, they've done that for God, God's done that for them, he can do that for me. Um, he was a provider before and he will be a provider again. Um, yeah. So we need to come to the altar with the knowledge that God has before and he will do again. Come to the altar with the acknowledgement of who our God is and let that influence your praise. Um, the, de the second definition that I had was a structure, and um, the altar is a structure upon offerings and sacrifices are made for religious purposes. So the altar, as seen in the Jewish um, translation as well, the altar clearly speaks of sacrifice and it can be demonstrated in a few ways. Um, I'm going to look at three today. Um, the first one I'm going to look at is God's sacrifice. So this sacrifice can be seen as he gives up Jesus. In order for us to have a relationship with him, he had to give up his only son. There had to be that sacrifice. Um, and it's not only that we could have a relationship with our creator, but it's so that we could also have eternity and spend eternity with him. Um, God's sacrifice of his son, I think, well for me, has become such a, like, a blasé thing. We're like, oh yeah, God died for us, Jesus died for us, and that's great. But it's so much more important than that. And I feel like every time I speak, I say that. But every time I read God's word, I'm like, Jesus died for us, and that, for me, is something to get excited about. Um, but it's not just, oh, Jesus died. It's, it led to total separation for Jesus and God. It was an ultimate sacrifice, and that's how great our God's love is for us. Um, we know that Jesus and God are part of a trinity. They're one in three, made of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in this act of sacrifice, Jesus' death on the cross, they had to become separated. Um, so we can read in Mark chapter 15, verses 34, it says, Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, which, um, and it said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Um, this was a father-son one that was closer than ever, and it was broken. Um, and imagine all the times that we think, oh, God's left us or he's not with us. When we've got no money in the bank, and I can say that I've said, God, where are you at? Because when I'm at uni, and I've got rent to pay, and I've got no money for food, and people are saying we need to go out, I'm like, but well, where's the money? But God hasn't left me. When things <coughs> don't go our way, um, when we lose a family member, um, when we've done the worst thing and we think, well, I'm never going to get back to God then, 
we seem to think that God left us and how would he have let that happen? But in these times, we're not alone. God remains beside us and he promises that he will never leave you alone. He will never walk off and he will never let you down. Um, sometimes we're shouting in your face, God, where are you? I thought you were supposed to be with me and he's standing right beside us. Um, so God's sacrifice is so that we might have redemption with him, so that we might come close to him. Um, so um, as we come to the altar, we've been redeemed, we've been com- compensated, and it's been paid for already. We no longer have to clean ourselves up and make sure we look okay um, to go to him. It's been done already. So I'm going to try and put this in an exam to understand. Say you go to shoe and you go to buy some night trainers. And these <coughs> trainers are expensive, and you've got your student discount ready, and you, like, you go up to the counter and you're like, okay. And the cashier goes, okay, that's 110 pounds. And you're like, oh. <laughs> you take out your wallet and then she goes, oh, it's been paid for. And you're like, okay. <laughs> Imagine you go to buy some perfume or you go to buy a house. And these are hundreds of, these, per, these houses are hundreds and thousands of pounds. And you, you're like, oh. And you go and it's got, oh, it's been paid for. That's what our life is. It's been paid for. We don't have to worry about it. In Romans chapter 8, Verses 31, it says, this is from the message translation, it says, with God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? In short, God did the most. He went the extra mile, he sorted it out. Um, But how can we find out what God has in store if we just sit back in our chair? If when he's saying, come to me, and we're like, nah, I don't need to, I've got it sorted. If in the midst of our circumstances and our situations, and they're swallowing us up, we just sit back and think it's okay. The verse continues to say, do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying, not threats not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture, none of that can separate us from God. He's more powerful than that. I know I've been through some hard hard times, and I'm assuming you guys have too, Um, but God doesn't let that stop us having a relationship with him. He doesn't let anything, no matter how bad we think we've done, he's still ready, like, he's like, come to me, I'm waiting for you. So come to the altar, do not limit the God that we serve because he is more powerful than any situation, anything that we've done. He's more powerful than that. And he, with Jesus, he's sorted it out already. So we're like, oh, I'm ready to go to God. But he's already sorted it out. He's already dealt with the situation. Before we even get into the situation, he's dealt with it. Um, we just need to step through it and stand before him. So come to the altar because there's a God who will do anything, who has done anything. Um, so that we could have a relationship with him. Come to the altar because he doesn't leave us. He's on our side and he's fighting our heads. Um, my second point in sacrifice is <coughs> Jesus' sacrifice. Even though Jesus and God are in the Trinity, their, their sacrifice is not the same. So Jesus' sacrifice is very different to God's. His sacrifice is represented in his responsibility to go to the cross. Jesus takes on our sins. He endures both physical and emotional pain for us. So, the physical pain can be seen in Mark chapter 15, verses 17 and 19. And I don't know if any of you are gardeners or have gardened, um, but you know when you have a rose and you, you cut your finger on one of the thorns, it hurts and it bleeds. But imagine having a crown of thorns around your head, where it's going to cut into your skin at several points, <clears throat> and then people are pushing it in. That's what God enjoyed. That's what Jesus enjoyed for you. Imagine being hit over the head with something, struck with a staff. He had that plus the thorns on his head, over and over. Imagine being spat on. He was pierced in his side whilst he was on the cross. And then he had the physical, cruci- the physical pain of crucifixion, the nails in his hands and through his feet. We may think we know pain. Well, I think I know pain, but in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. I know when you stub your toe on your desk, that hurts, and it hurts a lot, but that pain is so minute in the grand scheme of what Jesus went through us, and for us. 
he didn't just have the physical pain, he had the emotional pain as well. Um, in Mark chapter 14, verses 36, this is even before the crucifixion, he had the emotional pain. Um, he said to, um, to God, Lord, will you take this cup from me? Let it pass. I don't want to do it. It's too much for me. But he saw the bigger picture. He saw how much God loved you and went through it in the same way. He had that inner turmoil. That's before the cross. And then on the cross, he was mocked. They mocked him in worship. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. If your God come off the cross, they mocked his power. He was probably naked whilst on the cross. Imagine the, the embarrassment of that. But he did it for us. Elaine talks about um, knowing that we deserved it, knowing that we deserved to be and um, to have um, go through it. He took the hit for us. He did that. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we praise. Um, and without that sacrifice, the emotional and physical pain, the death on the cross, we would still be sacrificing animals. It would be the job of the high priest to go into the tabernacle and to atone for our sins. Um, he would go into the holies of holies once a year with the animals and he would perform the religious act of spattering the blood and um, putting the sins into the, um, to the animal. But Jesus tore the veil. Um, there's a song that we sing, I don't know if we sing it here. It goes, he tore the veil, he made a way when he said that it is done. And it's because of Jesus that this veil is torn that we can enter the holies of holies. Um, we can boldly go to God because um, he's done this for us. We can walk up straight to him. Um, there's not no having to go through this um, act of um, atoning through the animals. And it's not just once a year. Imagine if you make a, um, if you commit a sin the day after you've just been atoned. You have to wait another 364 days um, for you to be atoned again. We don't have to do that anymore. We can go straight to him. God, I've done this and I'm sorry. And I can go straight to him. Um, in Hebrews um, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, we have a hope as an anchor for the soul, sure and strong. It enters behind the curtain in the most holy place in heaven, which is the inner sanctuary, where Jesus has gone ahead for us. He has become the high priest forever. He is our mediator. He is the way that we go back to him. Um, Jesus has become that direct link for us to go back to God, that instantaneous um, connection. It's no longer that once a year thing. Um, in the era that we live in now, it's a fast thing. Everything must be done now. We want our dinner now. We want our money transferred now. We want it now. If the internet's not fast, what's going on? Um, but God upgraded 2,000 years ago. Like He's done it already. Like He's ahead of time. The holiest of places is no longer behind the curtain. It's right here. Um, we're set apart. It's not set apart for just one person to go to. Every one of us can go to him. Um, and it's not just um, when we're at church. If you're at home and you want to go to him, go to him. It's every minute, it's every hour, it's every second. When you need him, call upon him. Um, it's something to, get, well, I think it is, something to get excited about. It's no longer a religious act done by the priest. Um, we can do it for ourselves at any time. At convention, we talked about religion and relationship. This is a relationship that we're on about, being able to just go to the God. Go to God. Um, so come to the altar. Because it's a thousand times easier than it was in the times of Abraham and Isaac. Because Jesus went through the pain in order to make it easier for us. He saw that bigger image. And I'm not saying that it's easy to come to God. I know it's not easy. We do some things and we're like, no, we're not going to do anything about it. It will sort itself out. Um, and sometimes the things that we're stressing about are the things that hold us from going to him. Um, I know personally, when you go to a church service and the word's good, and you're like, yeah, that's for me, and they're like, okay, come to the front, and you just sit down. And you're like, and they say, no, there's someone else, and you just sit down. And you keep quiet, and you're like, turn around, oh, not me. But in those, situ in those times, we need to come to God. We need to bring our situations before him, because our God is greater than our issues, he's greater than our problems, and he's greater than our situations. The final part of the sacrifice is ourselves. What is the point in God doing anything if we're just going to continue to sit back? We need to come to the Lord, to his altar, to where he is. Um, when we're coming to the altar, usually it's talked about, oh, bring this before the altar, bring that one thing. Um, so if we come to God, we can come and we can drop off our bitterness. We can drop off our anger. 
We can drop off the sexual sins. We can drop off the jealousy, the laziness. We can drop off our relationships. But I don't think it's just that one thing that we need to drop off. Because underneath that one thing, there's something else. And when underneath that, there's something else. We need to bring all of us to God. We need to bring it right before him and say, here I am, God. This is, like, sort it. Um, we're simple people, and there's no doubting about it. Um, so we just need to, re- we need to remove all of the area that's corrupted, and only God can do that. Um, so yeah, each one of you are given a sweep. That's your sweep. Um, and this is going to be a visual representation. Um, I chose sweets because sweets are nice. Um, but um, I want to ask, if you're willing to give all of yourself to God, that you would come up and put it on the stage. Um, this is representing all of us. Not just part of us, because otherwise you'd have to break it up. But all of you. Um, the suite is going to act as the visual representation, and the stage is going to be our visual representation of an altar. Obviously, obviously, the suite is yours, just as your life is yours. And you can make your own choices. I'm not forcing anyone to bring it up. And don't feel that because somebody else next to you has brought it up, that you have to bring it up. Or because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't want to, that's, that's your thing. But if you want to bring up your sweet, bring up your sweet. It's bringing up you. Um, it's your choice. And it symbolizes us giving our lives to God. Bringing forth our situations, our problems, all of it to him. Um, yeah. Don't bring it up if you're not physically willing to bring your life to God. Because that was the point. Um, if you want to give your life to him, give all your situations and everything you have to him, for him to sort it, then I want to. I want you to bring it up for an act. So feel free when you're ready. Some of you are asking, do I get the sweet back? Like, can I eat it? But when you drop something off at the altar, you don't want to pick it back up. So in the same way, As much as we lack and joke, this is seriously, it's an important act, um, and it takes a lot, it's easy to drop a sweet on the stage, but it takes a lot to drop the things that hold us up, to drop them down before God. But we need to pray that we'd be able to, and that we'd have the boldness to bring them to God, because he's sorted it, he's going to sort it, that's our God. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to pray, I'm going to pray over every one of us. And if you agree with me, pray in agreement. Um, yeah. Lord Father God, I thank you that we're able to come to you, that we can boldly walk up to you and give everything that we have, the good and the bad. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would just um, hear our prayers, Lord. The things that trap us, Lord Father God, the things that we sometimes don't want to talk about, that we would bring them to you because you know them already. <laughs> Lord, I pray for boldness and confidence in each and every one of us that we would give them to you because you sort them out. Um, yeah, and I pray, Lord, that we won't pick them back up, that we leave them with you because we don't need them anymore. And I pray, Lord, that the things that we do get back, Lord, the things that we get from you would be things that would build us up and things that would take us into new seasons and bless others. Um, yeah, in your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, um, if there's anyone who wants specific prayer over bringing things to the altar, and that can be anything, um, and you want specific prayer over it, now's the time. Um, I'm willing to pray, um, and I know there's other people who will pray for you as well. And I pray that, and I ask that as we, if there is people, that the congregation, that church would pray as well, because we're a church that lifts other people, prays for them through their situations. So if there's anyone who wants specific prayer over any situation at the moment, now's the time.